All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. Hi everyone, welcome. It is 11.03 a.m. Today is Wednesday, May 29th, 2019. We are at the, at the Greenfield Public Schools Central Office meeting room. And this is a special meeting of the Greenfield School Committee. The address here is set, uh, 195 Federal Street, Suite 100. And we are being recorded by GCTV. Um, if there are any other members of the public that are recording, please let me know. See nobody. Okay, great. Can we have a roll call, please? Member Karen. Yes. Member. <laughs> Member Hollins. Yes. Sorry. Member Johnson. Yes. Member Nunez. Here. And Member Ekstrom. We have a quorum. Thank you, Secretary Ekstrom. Um, so our, for our first agenda item is public comment. I do believe we have at least one public comment today. Um, is that an okay place for her to be I, seated if, or? If she can hear, the camera can okay. see her. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Thank you, yeah, once you're set up. Thank you. Watch out for those so you all the time. Let me see, I think this is a glasses moment. Okay. I just recently switched from reading them to read. Switched to the meeting then to be. Super. Thanks for coming. Well, as I explained to Adrian, I, I didn't have an opportunity to get to the council meeting last week where the budget was voted on. And um, <clears throat> so let's actually formally start your public comment period. Oh, you have okay. three minutes, and if you could state your name and address for the record, please. Yep. So, Roxanne Wiedegartner, 85 Hastings Street, Greenfield. Go for it. Go. Yeah, All right. Minutes. Continuing that sentence. So anyway, I wouldn't have been able to speak had it been there, but I just wanted to um, make a statement regarding the budget issue. So it's, it's, this is not a statement. I'm going to read because it's just going to make it quicker. It's not a statement about what we must do going forward to ensure that we have sustainable funding for our schools. It's to say that I fully support your stalwart efforts toward adequately funding our city's schools at this moment. Your job, which the public has given you and you have so admirably undertaken, is to be stewards of our children's future. Sufficiently funding our schools is an expression of our community's values the value that we place on investing in the city's future, 
and in our children and the value we place on the importance of education. Our schools are the one chance we have for our children to acquire the education that they need at the elementary, middle, and high school level, and we are obligated to get it right. Having sat in your shoes before as a school committee member, I know how hard it is to come up with a budget and then come to an agreement on a budget request that not only meets our system's needs, but can also exceed it in areas where needed in order to remain competitive in today's environment and educate for the 21st century. The uncertainties of state, federal, and local funding make the job at crafting a budget on firm numbers even harder. In my experience, most people in our community, citizens and elected officials alike, share those values of the importance of funding education our teachers and staff and the safety of the schools. However, I also know that those same people who support our education funding want to have their streets maintained and plowed, their trash picked up, and their homes, property, and streets to be safe, all within an amount that we can afford. And therein lies our dilemma, and your dilemma in particular. Our citizens want to know that the school system is doing its part to contribute and manage well its share of the taxpayer funds for education. I stand with you and look forward towards the day when, um, as a town, we can hopefully achieve a stable and sustainable school budget. And that's it. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to sit for a little while, but I have some place to be at noon. So. If I walk out, it's not because I don't love it. <laughs> <laughs> because <you>. I do. <laughs> today um, we do have <clears throat> a need for executive session so if things start getting long in the public session um, I will definitely push us into executive session because uh, it's important business that we need to take care of today um, so I'll yield the floor to the superintendent to item number two audit request to commissioner thank you so in your packet starting on I think the fourth page of the packet there's a letter to the Commissioner of Education um, the school committee was informed of this by way of email on the 22nd and the town council was also um, informed of this potential action it's in front of the committee today to take a vote as to the action that you wish to take um, I am seeking an endorsement from the committee to submit this request for the Commissioner to do a full audit um, of the net school spending of Greenfield School Committee as well as the city. Mm -hmm. And this has a lot to do with the um, need to, to uh, for the school committee to uh, meet its obligation to net school spending as well as to um, have clear accounting for the city uh, portion of education expenses that we've talked about a number of times during this budget cycle. Um, and I think at this point that the, the uh, most straightforward thing to do that will be helpful to everyone is to simply request an audit that looks back over the last several years and identifies um, the city side costs, the uh, school side costs, and then um, specifically um, helps us update our agreement with the city as far as how we divide revenue and expenses. That was something that we heard over and over in this budget cycle, and so I'm just simply bringing it forward. This request is compliant with Massachusetts CMR 10.04, um, and specifically uh, invokes the commissioner's role to arbitrate um, any um, ambiguity between city side and school costs. And the draft letter is in your packet, along um, with some of the attachments. And then what I've passed out is the most recent copy of the, I think it's ended here, if you could keep sending those around. Just for your reference, this is the um, agreement that is the most recent agreement on file, has a one-page attachment and a one-page summary, uh, and this was signed in 2002. 
Um, and so this request to the commissioner is simply ask him to take a look at a document that's now 17 years old um, as part of the review of city side and school budget, particularly because the um, chapter 70 funding for schools is changing rather dramatically right now. It's a good opportunity to look at this and see if uh, this still meets everyone's needs. Okay, let's start with a motion. Uh, I would entertain a motion to support, to request that Commissioner Riley. What's the best language? Audit. The use of or our net school spending, Greenfield net school spending, um, as outlined in the draft letter presented today. Second. Okay. Um, you said you were entertaining I, a motion. Does that mean you were making a motion? Uh, either way, um, I can move it unless somebody else wants to move it. Same. Okay, I'll move it. Thank you for clarifying. And then second mm -hmm. by Susan Ekstrom. Did you have your hand up? Yes, I was going to comment on the motion. Okay. Um, I think where we have a 2002 agreement. I've never seen it before, so it's very interesting. Um, between the then superintendent of schools and the town manager, of course now we're not a town, is really interesting. And my question is, why would we not ask for a review of this document between what's now a city and a school district with the city instead of asking for an audit from the commissioner, which implies, in my mind, wrongdoing. I think it's a really interesting question and it really needs to be clarified. But why wouldn't we start with just talking to the city about how we divide funds since in the end we need an agreement? So that's my question. Everything Everything I've read about city schools and city budgets supports that you have to have a good relationship with your city. You know, we don't have independent authority to set our, determine how much money we get. And I think it would be less confrontational if we wrote the same letter to the city and worked with their city council on the distribution of funding research. Okay, I saw Jordana, and then I see Member Action and Member Karen. Did I'll, you? I'll go to those. Okay. Member Action. I think the, the issue is that we've asked for this information from the mayor numerous times, and he has straight out said, I'm not giving that to you. Literally sat in a meeting and said that. And I think that, I don't know what's been done in contact with the city, so I can't speak on that, but I, it shouldn't. It certainly shouldn't be that difficult to get the information that we're looking for and, and the response being, I'm not giving you that information. But member Karen, oh, I'm sorry, did you have more member action? No, that's it. I was just going to um, sort of state what Susan was saying. It's not necessarily that we just need to make a new, this way of understanding it, a new agreement. We clearly do. But we also just didn't, even in this new agreement, it just, it says actual costs and all that, but it's going to be an S. We didn't even get the numbers this year. So we couldn't make a clear budget based on our needs because we didn't know what they needed. And so I think it's, even if this, uh, the way I understand it, is this um, audit will give us what we should have known ahead of time. So next year, we'll be more ready. Well, I think there's a difference between going to the administrative head of an organization and going to the elected body. So I wasn't suggesting we go to the mayor. I was suggesting that we go to the city council who's struggling with their budget also and who talked about this at their meeting and first talk to them because they actively pursue the city budget on getting this clarified. And then if we need to jointly go to the bodies that oversee this, particularly around Chapter 70 funding. And I'm a, but I think we should first go to the city council because I think that's the first stop. Superintendent. Uh, there are three points I'd like to make. The first is the fact that a member of the school committee who's been on the committee for three years and served as our former superintendent has identified that this document is coming to you for the first time today, that you've never seen it. 
which I believe is what you said a few minutes ago, is an indication of the fact that this document needs to be updated and has been out of use for uh, seven, seven years of uh, your superintendency. Um, this document came recently at a town school meeting at, the, at which the school committee chair was present, and it's a good indication of the fact that we need a document that is a living agreement that everyone agrees upon. And it should be no surprise to everybody, through a six to eight month budget process, this should be guiding the work and not coming after the fact. The second is to the point about the uh, city council. I did approach the city council with this idea. I also spoke with the mayor, and the mayor, in an email to the city council and copy to the school committee, endorsed the audit. Um, and the third is that this is not a joint request between the city council and the school committee because it's within the school committee's purview. It's the school committee's authority to set the budget, and that absolutely should include the city side indirect costs. By law, the city must provide the indirect costs to the business manager for our end of year reports. It's only because we have requested that information on multiple occasions that we need to make sure that it's formally clarified at this point in time. Any members other than Member Hollins? Uh, Glenn, did you have any? Okay, Member Hollins? Well, another reason I think we should go to the city council first is that our school district also is, our own information also is, could be audited uh, for accuracy. And I just think that what one, going out of the city as an initial step um, just will stimulate, I'm not against looking at this at all. I'm not against updating information. I'm not against a new agreement. All of that's needed. But we also were not fully accurate in our information. And I'll pass this out. In, our, in the budget book, uh, our information, I just have to be, I read the budget book. Our information about school costs said that our contract obligations were 62,000. That's not accurate. It was over 300,000. And I think there's mutual, there's, there's tension around school funding and the accurate sharing of information between the school district and the city. And I, I think we should just start with some city school district elected officials taking this on as a first step. Yes. I was hoping not to talk today. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but when I'm accused of send, sending out inaccurate information, I, I have to. I did not. Okay, Member Hans, this uh, is a published document. Member Hans, Steve has a You point. certainly did accuse me of sending out inaccurate information. And the issue there is I think you're referring to contract obligations. And at the very beginning of the budget process, I said that I would rather put contract increases into the individual line items associated with the individual people, therefore those contractual increases are not in that particular line item. That $55,000 only reflects any type of increase for um, column changes, those types of things that are unknown at this time. All the other contract increases are known to the extent that we have an active agreement and active contracts with folks, not a, um, a not a global contract line. Um, so it's all in there. It's just in a different location. Henry Johnson. Um, sounds like the, the mayor and the superintendent are in agreement that this needs to happen. I think that the audit will actually provide us good information about how to proceed in terms of updating the agreement. I move to call the question. Okay, um, there's a motion to call the question. Is there a second? Second. Okay, that's not debatable. All those in favor of calling the question? Aye. Aye, that's unanimous. Um, okay, so the motion on the table. Gosh, Susan Farber, where are you? I'm kidding. I don't remember my exact language. Um, the motion is to support requesting an audit from the Commissioner of Education um, as supported in the draft letter presented today. That's obviously what I said. Um, okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And I think that's everyone, no abstentions. Okay, so the motion passes four to one.
Just make a note here. Just so I'm clear. Yes. Is this piece going as well? I, I believe it should go as an attachment. I think that it's fine. That's, I just didn't, it wasn't included in what was here, so I'm, I can update that. Okay, moving on to business item three, action on FY20 council's budget. Again, I'll yield to the superintendent. So, um, as you all know, the um, town council, city council, has now uh, voted an appropriation. I um, have a lot of respect for the work that the council had to do in wrestling with a challenging budget and a lot of respect for the needs of other departments across the city. Having said that, the city council was able to find and restore about $700,000 of the school committee budget back to the school department, leaving uh, us with about $700,000 still remaining between the mayor's budget and the school committee budget as passed. Um, what I'm seeking today is a vote from the committee formalizing the fact that uh, the superintendent, the business manager, and the school administrators are now in the process of recrafting a budget that matches the appropriation set by the um, city council. Um, and that, that means that the budget will not look the same as the school committee budget as passed. Um, in addition, we have had significant impact from the budget deliberation cycle, including staff that have sought other districts um, either for more security or higher pay. Um, and as a result, we are um, working with those vacancies and attritions to further uh, shape the budget moving forward. So I'd like at this time a vote that specifically authorizes the superintendent to um, continue working with the administrators and to come back with a formalized uh, proposal for meeting the FY20 budget. Um, and that uh, we can then review and discuss those details in the school committee would obviously vote the final budget. Um, this is an unusual budget cycle, so although this vote is not strictly necessary, I'm sort of asking that you authorize us to do that work because it is a significant amount of work and it involves going back to all the department heads and principals um, and will in include using some additional revolving funds potentially and making additional cuts as well. Member Johnson. I move to authorize the superintendent to work with the administrators to develop a proposal to update the budget so that it matches the appropriation set by the city council. Second, second by member Karen. Um, any deliberation? Member Hollins. I'd like us to look when we're doing this to look at our policies and our teacher contracts because our policies over decades set out our priorities <coughs> as a school district. Um, in particular, what I recall, we have a policy that says we are strongly support having instructional, we consider it a key priority to have instructional materials for our students. And we have another policy that prioritizes literacy, math and English literacy. Uh, we have teacher contracts that require, uh, I don't remember if it's 45 or 44 minutes of planning time for each teacher. Uh, at the grade levels, K to five, I believe, and that's where music and art come in, so I don't understand how those programs can be eliminated. I think you're going a little off course. I, um, we're but, speaking but about authorizing the superintendent. I understand, but in the superintendent's that. motion, it talked about uh, using more revolving funds. We have policies about that. We have policies about instructional priorities. And I'm just saying, in supporting the motion, that we look at our contracts and our policy priorities and follow them, too. Thank you. Any further deliberation? OK. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is unanimous. Um, okay. Anything further from that particular agenda item? Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to comment that there are a lot of people in this room that believe in public education. Um, and there are a lot of people that are familiar with their policies. However, we have a $700,000 gap 
between where we are, even with the generous funding that the council was able to find, and the school committee's budget. Um, and so the, the comments that were just raised are precisely why I'm looking for this authorization. There are difficult decisions to be made. And we can't actually comply with the policy of every priority on literacy, priority on arts, priority on education, uh, in health and wellness, in PE, and face a significant shortfall. Our, our budget is in staffing. So if the aim is to follow every policy to a T and uh, ensure that we're fully staffed, we need to be fully funded. Okay, moving on to number four. Um, legal memo regarding the two-thirds vote. Um, so I just, this, I had an interest in sharing this with the committee. This was a legal memo that went to the council. Um, I think the day of the council vote. And um, I'm in part bringing this to the table because simply for information I want everyone to know. Um, but also, I think that there is a need to consider whether or not we would like to also um, review this and get our own legal opinion related to the two-thirds vote. Uh, this is, in my own research related to the two-thirds vote, I found that this particular argument is questionable. Um, I also had a concern that this was coming from the city attorney's office that is also one of our attorneys. Um, and the reason why this is important is because the two-thirds vote dramatically impacted how the outcome of this interpretation of the two-thirds vote dramatically impacted the outcome of the council budget vote. Um, I think that it really dramatically impacted how uh, counselors decided to um, support the schools this year. Um, and also, it may have an impact on whether or not we would have additional funding actually added above the um, $700,000 that was given to the schools. Do you have any additional commentary or clarification? I, mean, uh, I think a further question here is, um, there's been a lot of conversation about the need to collaborate with city officials. Uh, and to share information. I think the school committee has done a, uh, demonstrated a commitment to doing that um, by sharing information and working with the executive and the council. Um, in this particular case, uh, I, it's my understanding the school committee chair reached out to um, uh, the city clerk in advance of the vote to understand the uh, interpretation of the two-thirds vote because two-thirds of the council was needed to raise um, the budget above the mayor's amount within the amount allowable by the tax levy. So the, the council could have added money to the school's um, budget, and the school department is the only one that can be done by law, uh, and that was expressed by the city finance director and the mayor and the council. But this particular interpretation of what was required to do that and how many people are constitute two-thirds, um, it, um, it appears this opinion was influential in that. At the outset of the deliberations, you heard many members of council say, because we don't have the votes required for two thirds, instead we're going to cut from other departments. And they said that at the outset. Um, I personally received this, I think, via the chair after the school, uh, the town council vote, um, although the, the chair requested it prior to the vote. Oh, and I will also say that um, in informal conversations with school council, uh, there is definitely a differing legal opinion on this um, as it relates to the, what constitutes two thirds of the public body. Can you repeat what it is you would like today regarding this? Um, I'm bringing this forward because I think that, I think that what would probably be the best thing to support the schools now and to support the school committee moving into the future and also the work of the city council moving into the future would be to have a legal opinion brought forward um, from an attorney that represents the Greenfield Public Schools. Um, and I think that it's important to get clarification on this. This isn't the first time that this has come up and been an item that has caused some confusion 
um, and conflict at the council level. And so moving forward, I think that we need to, as a body, have an, our own understanding and legal input related to uh, the law, the clarification of what a two-thirds vote actually means. Um, so my opinion is that we should be seeking a formal legal opinion to what the two-thirds vote is. That's my suggestion. Member Holland. I agree with you that this is a really important topic, and I agree with you there are probably different opinions, and it would be in our interest, some of our interests, to look at it more. But I don't agree we should be spending school district funding on this or to go to a school attorney on this. I think if we want more information, um, here's what I think. We should either ask the city council to get other opinions or we should write to the Mass Municipal Association. I'll bet there are dozens of opinions and rulings on this that are already on the record that we could ask for. I just I agree, but I don't it's not in our jurisdiction how the city council votes. I don't think we should be spending money for kids on the opinion. We should get the information some other way. Um, I see the superintendent and then member Ekstrom. I'll give it to the school committee member first. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot and, and watching how the town council runs and how the things that we do run and, and things that we have stumbled on. And you know, the school committee doesn't have any rules of procedure. And so I'm wondering, is it wise for us to take a look at the city's rules of procedure and see if we can adjust that or adapt it to how we maintain our sort of end of the business, I'll say, because doing that would um, help us to, I don't want to say avoid doing these kinds of things, but because they already have rules of procedure set forth, it may answer lots of questions for us. So I think that is actually slightly off topic. Um, although I support the sentiment. Um, the, this is in Massachusetts general law. So it's not just a rule of procedure of the council to have a two-thirds vote. It's in the state law to have a two-thirds vote. So it's slightly different. Um, did I see your hand? I did, but Georgina. Um, I agree that I hate to spend children money on things like this when it's a town thing, but this could have meant more money for us. A lot of more money. That wouldn't have had to be made from different departments because they could have used the tax levy if they wanted to, but they didn't because they didn't think they had enough votes because of these types of situations. So I don't, I'm don't. i not against getting another opinion. Um, I said this, it reads to me that Gordon already gave his opinion and now this is another opinion. So now, I mean, clearly there's lots and lots of opinions, but this opinion seems to agree with Gordon. So. I'm all for getting another one. Um, Superintendent, did you have I just want to say that the budget process is the single most time consuming and expensive process that we go through um, that reports to the committee every year. The amount of administrative hours that go into it and the impact on it is very significant. And as it should be, because it guides the work that we do, it's the roadmap that the school committee sets. It's absolutely within your purview to have an interpretation of how. Uh, the ability for the school committee to request this because it was the school committee's vote that allowed them to, to invoke this law. So it's absolutely a school committee issue whether you choose to you know, seek an opinion or not. Um, I, I do think it's squarely within the school committee's purview. Member Johnson and then Member Hollins. I move to request a second opinion um, from our own, own lawyers on this question. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Karen. Okay, um, I saw your hand, Member Holland. Yes, is there a reason we can't write to the City Council and ask if they would get a second opinion? I mean, it is their, it is mm -hmm. their functioning. I mean, <laughs> I don't think there's necessarily a reason why we can't write to them, but the motion on the table is to request an opinion from our school attorney. So I think that they're not, I mean, they're separate. Um, Member Ekstrom. So Gordon has given his opinion, and here is same office, different. So 
that opinion come in again, and I'm assuming that this is more formal. Um, we can get as many opinions as we want, but we're going to have to make a decision. So I don't know that getting an opinion, getting a third opinion or fourth opinion is, is going to benefit us by any means. Did you, I don't know that we need to get a second opinion. I mean, it's right here. If we want to ask the town what they think, just as a matter of procedure, mm -hmm. what they would follow. They think that's valid, because they probably spent all of their energies getting that information accurate. Um, yes, yeah, superintendent. So just to clarify, th this, this is coming from the city's attorney. Sullivan Hayes and Quinn is providing a legal opinion. <laughs> Two attorneys in that office have provided legal opinion. I think one of the reasons that there's a vote is because um, Attorney Quinn serves as both counsel to the town council and to the school committee. And in this case, those um, interests may be differing. Um, so there are times that the school committee may wish to have its own counsel some only advising on the school committee's interests. And then um, it, it's my understanding that this is less to challenge any uh, review of this particular decision and more just to make clear for the future and for the committee to understand. Is that your intent? That's my intent. Um, so reaffirmation? In order to move forward with some clarity or if there is a need for the council to reconsider or can, in the future when they're deliberating on the budget. This isn't the first time that this has come up and I feel like there's enough variability in these opinions um, and it's just unfair. It's unfair to the school committee, it's unfair to the kids, it's unfair to the counselors who were, who as was indicated earlier, were not interested in pulling from other departments um, and did have an option available to them in my opinion. And so I think it's important for us to have our own understanding of what the law is to be able to actually, you know, move forward. In terms of like reconsidering this year's vote, I am not sure that that's necessarily the best move, but um, so that's not necessarily at the heart of my intent. It's, I'm really looking forward, um, setting Greenfield up for success moving forward. Yes, Member Johnson. Um, I guess if you think about lawyers, like they, if they're looking at an ambiguous situation, who's writing the paycheck kind of does make a difference. Yeah. And if we write a paycheck to, to a lawyer to give us a, a determination, and it's concurrent with this, that's a good affirmation that good work has been done. And if there isn't, then that's kind of a that's good information for us to know going forward that depending upon the interest of who's writing the paycheck, you get a different result. And we could figure out where to go from there. Uh, I, I do agree that, that it does make a difference who, who is, who's hiring the person who gives the determination. So that's why I'm in support of, of this. Yes, uh, the other point of information about this was simply information sharing to the committee. I think one of the reasons that um, it was expressed to me to put on the agenda was because uh, simply it's informational to the school mm -hmm. committee uh, and was not shared publicly with the school committee or by email um, prior to the chair's requesting of it. So it's also just informational uh, because it is an opinion that governs school uh, committee funding. More problems. And my last comment, my understanding is we've put a freeze on supplies for children. Uh, this is a very specialized research decision we're asking for on municipal law. And we're going to ask an attorney who doesn't specialize in this, who supports us. I agree with what my colleagues on the committee have said. But I think we could write to the Mass Municipal Association and ask for their all the different opinions they have on this topic to inform ourselves or, or write to the city council. I just don't see spending our money on this, but I agree in getting the information. That's a clarification. Could, could I please clarify? I think I understand you to say that school funding is not the pur purview of the school committee and that laws governing the school committee requesting funding by a municipality is not the purview of the school committee. I've why, never why? said such a thing, and you know that I've never said such a thing. No, no, I actually understood you to say that this is I don't, I don't is want to keep being challenged by your superintendent. Thank you. I would okay. like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly clarifying. Is this, it your This would be the third 
challenged by you and the business manager? There have been zero manager. challenges. I'm looking for clarification. Do you feel that funding is a municipal issue and not a school committee issue? Because you've said that a school committee attorney would not understand this area of the law. And that's not I my understanding. He wouldn't understand it. Okay. We're going to move on. There is a motion on the table to request an additional opinion um, from the school committee attorney. Um, given that we have two attorneys, one of them is Sullivan Hayes and Quinn, and one of them is Peter Smith, um, it's my understanding that the intention of the motion would be to reach out to Peter Smith for a formal review. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, are we ready to vote? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? One opposed abstention motion carries. Um, okay, the next is a follow up on the open meeting law training that was requested. Uh, there's just the email everyone received this or should have received this in their inbox back on May 15th. Um, so I did reach out as part of our response to the open meeting law complaint to the Attorney General's office. And um, they responded with this information related to local trainings and online trainings um, and stated that they were not able to come excuse me, to Greenfield to provide us with a training. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to follow up on that and see how we may like to receive an open meeting law training. I think that we could request a training from one of our attorneys. We could request a training from the MASC. Um, there may be other possibilities for requesting a training um, as well uh, we could individually utilize the online tools um, or any number of other ideas or options that may come to the table today um, I see Susan Ekstrom first and then Katie and then Susan Holmes so just as if, if we were all able to do this on our own is there a way to prove that someone has done the training, for example, when you do, I don't know, when nurses do some online training for HIPAA laws, there's a certificate, a certificate they are given that has their name and says you have taken a HIPAA training. Is that is there anything like that on here, do you know? If you don't know, that's fine. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I saw your hand, are you, okay. Um, I, I appreciate the idea of doing the webinar because it's a little easier on schedule. My concern is that um, we all have been given these rules before and seem to be interpreting them in different ways, which isn't just a problem with these rules. It's often a problem with all kinds of things that we all look at them and think it means one thing and then it's not. That may may not solve any problems if we don't have a person to actually ask questions to. No problems. I think the, the level of clarity on the nuance of these laws is not our functioning, our successful functioning as a public body is not going to be helped by either individuals having webinars or getting information uh, from the MASC. No disrespect to the MASC. It's very specialized. The city is, is very active on this issue um, of public information. The second body that we could consider who gives out legal opinions on this as part of the role is the Mass Municipal Association. The city has guidelines from them that are even more specific than the Attorney General guidelines because there's rulings on this. I've had now I think five conversations with the Attorney General's office and have met with the city a couple of times. I don't think we're getting clear and inf accurate information either from each other when we say what we think we heard or we read. And so I think it's important that we meet as a group with someone who's an authority on this law because we're not getting accurate information and it's really important. Robert Johnson. Um, from the opening law, 
webinar that I went through when I was an employee at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. This is not a particularly complicated area of the law. And um, I think that there are a ton of resources that are available online for people to learn. People were required to attend, you know, eight hours of training and being school committee members when they first um, came on. Some of us have experience in education and leadership where knowing about this law and, and putting it into practice was hopefully part of just daily life. Um, I think that there's been a kind of a story that's being told about about school committee members kind of have been equally kind of in need of education and training on this topic and that from my viewing of, of emails that have been disclosed and whatnot, that's really not the case. Some of us, I think, some people are getting it and some people are not. But I, I do think to um, be in the spirit of the request for the uh, from the person who complained about the open meeting law violations, it would be useful to have um, some version of in-person training where there could be an opportunity for questions and answers. But those trainings are happening around the state on, on a particular schedule. Um, I don't know if, I don't know how quickly we could get someone or who would be the appropriate person, but I, I do think the in-person training and the opportunity for members to ask questions would be useful in terms of responding to the complaint. Member Hollins. It's my last comment. I will take from the record and write out for this committee the misinformation we've received on open meeting laws so you can see it. And in the conversations I've had with the Attorney General's office, you can shake your head, but I'll take it from transcripts and provide it to you, and then you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. From the conversations I've had, there are systemic issues in how we function that contribute to people communicating, and I think we have to address that if we're going to have a successful public body. Can you clarify that? I don't know what that means. Well, for example, one of our particular issues is that we have three member subcommittees. And that's harder than four member subcommittees, which we can't have because that's a majority of the school committee. So if we have a guideline that we cannot ask questions individually, and it has to be from two people, and so you Based on that guideline, we ask a question to the chairman of the three-person subcommittee. That's technically an OML violation if you say why you want to put the question. If we have a guideline that we don't have our budget enough in advance that we can ask our questions at public meetings, then that's a systemic issue that we can fix, but it, it creates situations where people are asking questions when they don't have enough time to review, review material. So I want to stay on topic here. We're talking about following up on the open meeting law training specifically. Um, we don't yet have a motion here on the table. I'm not saying that there aren't changes. I'm, I'm supporting that, that we meet as a group because it isn't just the detail of the law. It's how we function that, that, that is unique and creates challenges the timeline that we review things. Whether or not we put on our agenda a time for people to share what they'd like on the agenda. If we do, that's helpful. If we don't, then people have to write about it. That's all. In the Attorney General's opinion, Okay, so again, um, we are following up on this open meeting law training and whether or not you know what we want to do about it because we couldn't, as we were told, have the AG come to us to give us the training. So um, as I noted at the beginning, I think there are a couple of options. We could have our own attorney come and give us the training. Um, we could have the MASC come and give us the training. Um, we could attempt to attend an online training. I did just pull up the website for um, the AG's office, and I do not see any train webinar trainings nor in-person trainings scheduled yet beyond May 23rd. So we've passed um, 
May 23rd. Um, so we're looking for a solution to the open meeting law training that we committed to in response to the open meeting law complaint. Member Extra. I'd like to make a motion to contact MASC to sit with us to do an open meeting law training. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second by member Karen. Any further deliberation on that? Um, I'm wondering whether to offer some kind of friendly amendment because if MASC ends up being a dead end, if there's another body that could be helpful to us, wouldn't want the motion to preclude us from being able to follow up with mm -hmm. another group. Okay, so a friendly amendment to include uh, what, any additional appropriate bodies that may um, support us I mean, to include the MMA potentially. I'm putting words in your mouth, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Is it just kind an of appropriate body to teach, to <laughs> hold a, something for open meeting law training? Uh, I mean, the, you know, the option is we get very specific or we get crazy and say, I don't know, right, like the right. dude down the street comes in and does the thing. Yeah, yeah. It has to be someone that rules some of these things. It either defends, just not a generalist. So I think it needs to be our attorney in the Mass Municipal Association or the AG's office. I don't know why you were told they couldn't come and I was told they could come. But those are the people that do rulings. So you can read their rulings. And hold on, hold on. So, can you clarify your friendly amendment to make it more clear? <laughs> um, sure, I'll do my best. So, so the friendly amendment would be to make the request of a um, organization currently providing trainings on open meeting law in Massachusetts. True school committees, or in general? In general. Okay. I wouldn't specify. Okay. And that works for you. You gave the second, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that sounds fine to me. I, you know, I also wouldn't necessarily want to make this exclusive to only the MASC. If there are some other agencies out there that can provide a training for us, I think it's uh, a worthy option. Okay. So, any additional deliberation on that? Yeah. Can I just yes. make a quick comment? Yep. If perhaps we contact other school committees and tell them that we're doing this and then we can all bear the cost. Mm -hmm. Then the Attorney General might be willing to come to us if we have yeah, five it's other areas. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We can't. We can't be the only school committee that's going to do this. We can't be. Okay. So, just thought. Great. Cool. I'm seeing a consensus support for that, so um, I think that's a great idea, too. Okay, so everybody's clear on the motion. We are essentially going to uh, explore other options for who can come to give a training. Um, some of the options that were discussed today were the MASC, the MMA, um, and it was noted that there could be other organizations or agencies that are giving these trainings and would be able to answer specific questions that we may have. And then there was also an interest in inviting other school committees or public bodies to a big meeting to address them. Obviously, that wasn't the exact motion, <laughs> um, but I want to, to confirm that we're all sort of, that's a summary of the spirit of the conversation. Um, okay, great. Well, uh, all those in favor? Okay. So, yes. Just to add a comment that I'll be attending the eight-hour um, Massey uh, orientation for new school committee members on June 8th in Charlton. I think it starts at 8 a.m. If anyone wants a road trip, it includes open meeting laws. So. Yes, yeah. it does. It's <laughs> very thorough. Okay, great. So I will review and
come back to the committee, I guess, pardon me, in, at the June meeting, or just go ahead and try and get something scheduled for us to be continued. Um, okay, so at this time, this concludes all of our public business. Um, we do have a need to enter into executive session. Um, according to MGL C30A 213, this is to discuss strategy re with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body. And the chair so declares, this is um, regarding the administrative assistance contract. Um, so that can stand as a motion to enter into executive session. Is there a second? Second. Second by member Karen. Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, we are back in public session. Um, and I believe that we do have a motion, or I would entertain a motion to approve the tentative agreements and substantive changes presented today uh, regarding the administrative assistance contract with final language um, for the contract forthcoming. So moved. Second. Thank you. <coughs> Move by Katie, seconded by Member Johnson. Um, is there any additional discussion? I'd just like to say I think that this um, addresses the hard work of our administrative assistants who do an awful lot of work to keep our schools running and um, uh, promotes interest in staying with the school system uh, over a longer period of time and uh, is able to make modest adjustments to uh, salary schedule so that we can continue to have the best people working for us. Thank you, Superintendent. Yes, Member Johnson. I also applaud the administrative assistance and appreciate everybody who worked on this agreement. It seems like a great improvement to what was there. Thank you, Member Johnson. Member Hollins, you indicated earlier you have a question. Um, I'd like to motion that we... There's a motion on the table. Oh. Did you have a question? Uh, my question is just the process now for notifying the city of the initial uh, agreement, the agreement, and the uh, first year costs, which I think are typically covered by the city. I'd like to clarify that. And clarify the process or? For the, for our budget purposes. So, generally speaking, at this point, when we approve a contract, the contract then moves to the city council for um, final, essentially final approval and approval of the first year cost difference. Um, this has been the process in Greenfield for a very long time. So, um, if we vote to approve this contract today, the exact numerical value will get sent to the mayor's office and council president um, with appropriate and in other individuals CC to it. And um, the process will move forward there. In terms of timing, I am not sure of the timing of this. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if it'll get expedited to be included in FY19 or whether it will get bumped into FY20. Um, those are decisions that will need to be made, I believe, by the mayor and then by the council. Yes. Am I correct that the city has a special fund that funds our first year of the new negotiated agreement? So yes. That we won't typically need to add this to our it FY19. Is, it is not our practice to um, pay for the first year of any approved contracts through the operating budget. Um, Thank you. Pay for the difference. The increase. In the increase, yeah. So, and yes, the city has an account called contract stabilization. Um, and I believe that there are other stabilization accounts that are sometimes utilized in order to support uh, the contract approval process. 
Um, I assume you are both available after if people have follow-up questions um, related, related, to, to, related to contracts and process. process. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I need to uh, call the question. Okay. Um, is there a second to call the question? Second. Okay, all those in favor of calling the question. That is unanimous. Um, all right, we've got a motion to approve the TAs. All those in favor? The tentative agreement for administrative assistance. <laughs> the motion, as close as possible to the exact language, was to approve the tentative agreements for the administrative assistance and substantive changes to the contract with final language forthcoming. <laughs> OK, all those in favor? Aye. 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 That is unanimous. Fantastic. Um, that concludes our business for today. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Beautiful. Thanks again, everybody. The time is 1.10 p.m. All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. Yeah!